Hey folks, this is Riker, with a beginner's guide to newly released action RPG, Wilson Lords of Mayhem. Now this is part 2 in a sponsored video series. Part 1 was my first impressions of the game. Part 3, stay tuned for that, will be a beginner build guide. But in this video, we're going to go over the mechanics of Wilson, how it differs from other action RPGs, and give some beginner tips and suggestions and best practices. So first off, when you're creating a character, you'll have some cosmetic customization options, but then you'll get to pick your starting weapon. Don't fret too much over this decision. You are not picking a character class. Wilson does not have character classes per se. You effectively build your own class through the skills and passives you select. Your choice here will reflect what your starter equipment will be and your starting skill, but you can pretty much immediately change that, so don't stress it. Now, once you're in-game and you start gaining XP and leveling up, you'll note that that is when you effectively start to build your character class, and it's all through the passive skill points. You can press P on your keyboard to open the Gate of Fates, and this is one of the big features that sets Wilson apart from other action RPGs. Now, it's not uncommon to see a big passive skill tree, but in Wilson, you can rotate your different wheels around in order to mix and match different combinations. And of course, you're going to start at the very center of the wheel, where you have your three archetypes of Mage or Scholar, which is the blue orbs. You have your Fighter type, which is going to be the Soldier or the red orbs, and your Range type of character, which will be the green orbs for the Sentinel type of class or archetype. So in general, melee tough guy, red, roguish or ranged green, spellcastery stuff is blue. You have your small nodes, which offer smaller buffs, and then your larger nodes, which tend to have something either more game-changing or at least more significant. Then when you expand out into your second wheel, you see that you have two green archetypes, two blues and two reds. Looking at the greens, the ranger is the prototypical ranged attacker. If you want to make some form of an archer, you probably want to go for the ranger. On the other side, though, we have the assassin archetype. This is more lurking in the shadows, applying poison, being sneaky. Then looking at our red archetypes in the second ring. On one side, you have the warmonger. This is for a more DPS-oriented type of warrior. And on the other end, we have the praetorian, who is more of a tank. So if you want to focus on being tanky, blocking with shields, having resistance, you go Praetorian. If you want to be more of an in-your-face warrior, dishing out lots of damage, the Warmonger is the option. Then for your blue or mage archetypes, you have the Cabalist and the Warlock. The Warlock is a little bit more of a typical spellcaster. You're going for spell damage. And your Cabalist focuses on things called ailment stacks. So what an ailment is in Wilson is some kind of negative effect that persists for a period of time. You can either deal direct damage to an enemy or you can stack poison damage or a freeze effect or a stun effect from uh, electricity or a burning ignite effect. So the Cabalist is really good at applying these ailments and stacking them up on an enemy. It's a lot of damage over time effects and crowd control type of effects, nerfs. Then we expand all the way out into the final ring. Now every color has four different options. At this point, we're way beyond archetypes and we're into some serious specializations. For green, one of the options is the White Arrow. This is basically a frost projectile build. Then next we have the Dusk Glaive. This is really a shadow assassin. He has high mobility, he's good at dealing small bursts of big damage, and you can also specialize him into a sort of hybrid class that casts spells and also attacks. Then the other two, the Alastor and the Exorcist, they are both specializations that focus on increasing your damage, but they have different ways of going about it. Both these subclasses give you different extra resources to manage to gain more damage, more defensive buffs, and it's altogether more complicated specialized playstyles. Then for our red specializations, we have the Eos, who's something of a holy warrior, specializing in sacred damage, and also filling a little bit of a support role in a party, being able to resurrect allies. And then the Arms Master is someone who specializes both in weapon attacks, gaining different benefits depending on what weapon he's wielding, but also benefits from having a high block chance with shields, and is able to enter a stance that alternates between 
having really high defense or sacrificing defense for more damage. So that adds another layer to the gameplay. And then the Child of Fury is something unique. It is a flaming fire warrior. He specializes in dealing fire damage, and as he attacks enemies, he builds up stacks of fury, attacking faster and faster and faster while his own defenses decrease. Then the Siegebreaker is basically the ultimate tank. He specializes in sitting in place, gaining massive toughness, massive defense, and gaining damage by remaining stationary. Then for our blue specializations, our mages, we have the Plaguebringer, who is our summoner specialization and who also dishes out poison damage. We have our Oracle of the Trinity, who is our elemental specialist, fire, cold, and lightning. Then you have the Time Weaver, who specializes in inflicting stasis upon enemies. That's basically a stun and gaining buffs when they do so. And then you have the Abyssal Shaper, who specializes in ailment stacks. This can also be a really good support type archetype because you also are able to gain buffs to yourself and your whole party, depending on the ailments you inflict on enemies. Now, when creating your character, I recommend having some form of idea of what sort of character you would like to put together. If you can, decide ahead of time where you want to go in the third wheel, where you want to go in the second wheel. And note that it is possible to mix and match. You don't have to go all greens or all reds. You can go red, green, blue. You can go two reds and a blue. You're making your own class, so you can decide how you want to put things together. In general, it is easier to match similar colors. You're more likely to come up with a build that is viable. And if you do make a mistake or change your mind, you can reset your points at a cost. But I would recommend when you start off, Pick where you want to go on the third wheel, where you want to go on the second wheel, and then start allocating points to grab the larger nodes along the way. Those will tend to be the most impactful. Pick a path that will pick up the kinds of nodes that you also want. For instance, if you want to go with more projectile damage over more maximum health. But try to optimize your way to grabbing those important game-changing and gameplay-changing nodes while letting your path sort of fill up with additional small nodes. You'll even have some that are intermediary nodes, like this one here. It's bigger than the smallest, but smaller than the biggest. These two are important, and just be sure to really think about what kind of playstyle you're going for. Pick nodes that'll optimize that kind of damage or offense, and you also want to have in mind what is your defense going to be and then optimize along that defense. For instance, you might have more health over energy shield, which we'll explain in a little bit. So, for instance, if you want to be an energy shield build, then definitely take a lot of the defensive nodes around energy shield. If your build seems focused on resistances, make sure you pick up a lot of resistance nodes. You cannot ignore defensive nodes in this game. By the end of Act 1, you're going to want to have around 2,000 combined health and energy shield, or you could have some difficulty taking on the boss depending on your build. It's really easy to go with some kind of ranged attacker, be it an archer or a mage, and go full-on DPS, and you're going to have a lot of difficulty against the Act 1 boss if you do that. It is not an easy fight. Now let's take a look at our attributes, which will help fill up those health numbers. This game has four attributes, Ferocity, Toughness, Agility, and Wisdom, and they all do something very specific. Ferocity increases your crit chance, both with attacks and with spells. Toughness gives you more health and more energy shield. Agility increases your attack speed and spell casting speed. And Wisdom increases your chance to inflict ailments. Now every level you gain 10 attribute points. And in fact, each of the attributes gives you extra damage. The game will dynamically look at what is your primary attribute, which is the highest score, and it'll give you bonus damage based on that. Then your secondary will give you a different percentage of bonus damage, etc. Now, I'm not sure what the exact formula is, but playing around with the numbers, it seems that roughly 40 to 45% of your main stat is converted into bonus damage. So for example, roughly 40% of 463 translates into about 206% bonus damage. For your secondary attribute, it's roughly a third that gets converted. For your tertiary attribute, it's about 20%. And for your lowest attribute score, it's about five to 10%. So that means that when it comes to raw damage, you're most rewarded for pumping points into a single attribute. But that means that even if you put points into another attribute, 
you are still gaining some amount of damage from it, just not as much. My advice here would be consider the build that you are looking to run and try to focus on one to max three attributes. I believe I've actually spread myself too thin here, but toughness is an attribute you cannot ignore. Be it health, be it force shield, you really do want toughness. Whether you keep it as your primary or your secondary attribute, it's kind of up to you, but don't neglect it. If your build does not revolve around ailment chance, you probably don't have to put a single point into wisdom. And if your build doesn't care about crits, you can maybe ignore ferocity, or if you feel you don't care about attack speed or spellcasting speed, you can maybe ignore agility. Now these stats as well can be respect. so if you find you've not put enough toughness and you are absolutely stuck and you don't want to farm up more points to get past a certain area, you can always try resetting your attributes, reallocating them, or if you feel you're way too tough and can do with some more damage, you can do that as well. Now before we look at the skills, let's take a look at the resource system. So you have your health bar and your force shield. Force shield depletes first, regenerates faster than health. In general, you either don't care about force shield at all or you care about it very much. And then we have something that makes Wilson very unique, which is its dual resource system, willpower and rage. Willpower regenerates slowly to rapidly on its own and that is used to cast spells. Rage is used to activate attacks. So there's two types of skills. It's either a spell or an attack. Those are our two resource consumers. Now, as you spend willpower, it converts into rage. And as you spend rage, it converts back into willpower. Now, you also have two potion slots. And apart from your health potions, you also have willpower potions and rage potions in case you want to be able to instantly generate. Then we also have stamina potions because we have stamina points. You can unlock up to eight. And every stamina point gives you a dodge roll with spacebar. These slowly regenerate and sometimes there are mechanical game effects that can be tied to stamina points or the dodge roll. As an example of using up willpower to generate rage, we're going to teleport around casting spells and you see after some delay it is slowly converting into rage. And then if I want to spend the rage to turn that back into willpower, I'm starting to activate a rage attack and it's slowly refilling that willpower bar. Now you can see that there's something of a delay. It's not instantaneous. It takes some time and there's still some resource tied up as it's grayed out, unable to be used until it catches up. Now there are things that you can do to speed up or slow down that conversion rate or how much it holds on to one resource over another. Depending on your build, you might care only about rage or only about willpower, or you can make a hybrid build that uses both and allows for a sort of back and forth synergy. That's what I really like to make in Wilson, those kinds of builds that use both, but you don't have to. And it all comes down to what skills you use. So let's take a look at some of the skills here. Now your active skills, you will find them as skill tomes in the world, or you can purchase them over here at Demetra. She'll sell them on this tab over here, and you can also level up your skills at Demetra, or they'll level up naturally as you play the game and have them equipped. So Ether Jump here, this was that teleport skill you were seeing me use. As it levels up, you gain modifier points that you can assign to these different modifiers. The more you level a skill up, the more modifiers will become available to you, but you can never select all of them. You're always going to be limited to pick between the modifiers available. Each modifier costs a certain amount of points. For instance, one, 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 this one costs two, so if, for instance, at the time I only have two modifier points to spend, then I can either pick two out of these three, or I can pick this one modifier. Now, these are free to respec at any time. I can click them around, no problem. Furthermore, as you level up these skills, they also become more powerful, and every skill has tags. So, first off, is it a spell, or is it an attack? Some of your passive nodes might buff your attack damage, but not your spell damage. Then there's also restrictions on only usable with certain items or weapons. For instance, any type of spell requires either a staff or a catalyst. A catalyst is an off-handed item that allows you to wield anything else in your main hand, be it a melee weapon, a ranged weapon. It's what enables you to have these hybrid builds between spellcasters and attackers. And then there's also certain tags like spell and movement or spell and projectile. And again, these tie into the modifiers that we see, for instance, in the passive skill tree. If you have something that buffs projectile damage, well, that would affect Arctic Spear, for instance. Or on Avenger Auto Turret, we have attack, projectile, rogue, and device. 
these tags will tie to different mechanics in the game. Now, as a baseline, you'll be able to allocate one, two, three, four, five different spells. You cannot replace your main attack, which is just your weapon attack, depending on whatever weapon you have. And there's a way to eventually unlock another one, but that will be later in the game and we'll explain how in a bit. Now, some of these skills will cost different resources. In general, spells cost willpower. In general, attacks cost rage. Some are on cooldowns. Some are only on cooldowns and don't have a resource cost. At any point, you can swap out the skills that you have here equipped, and you're not going to lose whatever levels that you leveled up on them, but you are limited to how many you can equip. In general, I would recommend having one primary attack skill that can deal area damage, something that allows you to take out multiple enemies at once. And then if you can, have one skill specifically for single target, and then you can have some more situational things, be it buffs or debuffs. Having a crowd control skill could be really useful. I like to have a mobility skill, either Ether Jump or even Lightbringer if you don't have Ether Jump yet. Just try to ensure that every skill you pick serves some purpose that is not redundant with another skill. So for instance, in my case here, I have my mobility with Ether Jump. I have my Avenger Auto Turret, which really helps me against single target and also it just sort of does passive damage while I'm dodging attacks. I have my Liver Mortis Summon, who is really just there to draw aggro and keep the heat off of me. And then I have my Death Gazer Railgun, which is my bread and butter attack. Then lastly, I have Phantom Blades, because it is on a cooldown and does not cost any resource, so it's effectively just a free attack that I've thrown in. So now let's take a look at gear. You have a number of different gear slots, and gear can drop at different tiers of quality. From normal to magic to rare to legendary and even unique. As you're gearing, ensure that you're making choices that fit with your build. For instance, if you're a mage and are only casting spells, then don't bother giving you anything that grants you faster attack speed or attack damage. You'll note as well that some items have things like plus 5 seconds rage conservation time. Again, that helps you hold on to that rage a little longer before it dissipates back into willpower. We also have, for instance, negative transfer time reduction between willpower and rage. That helps you hold on to that willpower a little more. And this can be a good thing or a bad thing, again, depending on whether you're a hybrid build or not. The last thing to consider when it comes to gear are sockets. Sockets come in different colors, but also in different tiers. So for instance here, I have two green sockets. One is defense one, one is defense three. And then on my helm, I have another green and that's defense two. So there are three tiers per color. And you can see the full list of colors depending on the gems because gems are what go into sockets. Now, neither the color nor the tier means it's good or bad. They all do different things. For instance, on this Lapis Lazuli, offense one adds lightning damage to attacks. Offense two adds lightning damage to spells. Then Offense 3 adds Shock Ailment damage. So again, depending on your build, some of these will be important to you, some of them will be useless to you. And the game has a plethora of different types of gems. They'll add different types of attack or spell damage, they'll give different types of resistances, they'll give a variety of different support effects. Again, consider what your build is and make the optimum choices towards buffing your strengths. See, what is your build good at and make it even better at that? Then these other items, these crafting materials, they all do exactly what they say in the text. As a general rule, if you don't have many of a crafting material, it's probably best to save it for a really good item or for when you're closer to end game. But we might have to have a future video for best practices when it comes to crafting. Now, another aspect of character building that I want to touch upon here is your apocalyptic form. If you press F, which will only unlock once you get, I believe, to Act 2 in the campaign, that is when you can start selecting one aspect of Apocalypse. Now for these, I would say, look through them, look at what they do, pick whichever you feel is the coolest. Your Apocalyptic form is something that comes up seldomly, but it is effectively an alt. You want to save it for really important engagements. It's really not often that you get to use it. So pick the kind of playstyle you think you'll like, pick what might blend better with your build. The aspect of Dawn is something of a holy warrior. The aspect of War is something of a fire demon. The aspect of Infinity is something of a spellcasting missile launcher. And the aspect of Flesh is a roguish demon. And you can also eventually unlock more. Now you're able to activate your apocalyptic form through gathering Primordial Essence. It's going to fill up along 
this little area over here. It drops as what appears to be white health globes, in essence. In primordial essence. And in fact, one trick you might be able to do is, if you can time it right, if you think you're about to die in a boss fight, pop into your apocalyptic form. Now, as a last general note on gameplay, I think I'll mention that while playing through the campaign, you might find that the bosses are very difficult. I'd say that every boss in Wolsen is more difficult than any boss in Diablo 3, for instance. The Act 1 boss in Wolsen can feel like the endgame boss in other action RPGs. Unless you're geared to a point where you can just face tank things, it's going to be a lot about positioning and outlasting and surviving. Bosses have many phases, many different attacks, but they're all telegraphed very well. You'll see areas appear on the floor, don't stand in the damage areas. It's pretty straightforward, but sometimes you might have to become acquainted with the boss fight before you're able to take it on, before you're able to overcome it. So if you die to a boss, for instance, try not to get discouraged. Try to think, okay, what did I learn from that? What am I prepared for now with the different phases that'll happen, with the different attacks that'll happen? What's my game plan? How's it going to change? Now, once you've completed the campaign, you unlock another game mode. And in it, you have something of a city management. If you talk to Thunderblade over here, it brings up a different menu where you get to upgrade different things in different ways. Some are personal upgrades, some are upgrades to your city, to your base. And these upgrades will have different costs. It might be gold costs, it might be essence costs, and it might just be productivity costs. Now, productivity is a resource just for this sort of metagame within the game. The way productivity works is, let's say for instance you have 25 productivity and you want to build something that costs 100 productivity, it will take four turns. You spend 25 per turn on any given active project and the number of active projects you have can be increased, your productivity can be increased, and I would encourage you at the start to start by boosting your productivity after you've, in fact, unlocked your Seeker's Garrison, which is the sort of passive missions that can passively give you gold and other rewards like gear. Now, you'll note that I mentioned turns. Well, what is a turn in Wolsen? How does that work? You have your Mandates board and your Expeditions map. These are dungeons that you get to run. When you finish a dungeon, that makes a turn pass. And I think sometimes turns can pass more if you're in a more involved dungeon. So mandates are just the most absolute, bare minimum, easiest missions to do. There's nothing special to them. A portal opens, you're given a mission, you go in, you execute the mission. Then an expedition is something a little more involved. In an expedition, you have to kill a bunch of monsters until you fill up a bar. Once that bar has filled up, a boss will spawn and you have to kill that boss. At that point, you'll have the option to either end your expedition or delve deeper. And if you delve deeper, the next level will be more difficult. And if you ever fail, you will not get your reward. Now, what does failing mean? Well, you have to die and run out of lives. I think you have three lives, so you can afford to die three times in a dungeon before you have failed. If you're playing multiplayer, your allies can revive you. But basically, you have to make the decision between, all right, well, do I want to risk going deeper and possibly not getting any reward at all for any of these levels. The deeper you go, the better the rewards get. Sometimes you'll find items that you can pop into a map slot here to open a special expedition. But then outside of that, before opening your expedition, you can roll area modifiers. These are things that will make the expedition more difficult, but you'll get greater reward. For instance, 20% more magic, 8% item quantity, and a productivity bonus. And I believe you can stack up to five of these before you no longer have room to add any more. So we select one, then we can choose to roll yet another modifier. And once you've rolled, I believe, four, some number, you'll have the option to lure untainted. Now this doesn't cost gold, but instead primordial essence. If you lure untainted, that makes the expedition even more difficult, but it changes it in such a way that no items will drop throughout the expedition, items will only drop at the end, and untainted monsters, some pretty nasty monsters, will spawn throughout the level and try to kill you, and you have to survive them. I believe the game says it's suggested to do this only in a party, but I was able to solo it well enough. One thing to bear in mind, though, when deciding whether you want to stack these up or not, I found that in general, if you're trying to grind gold, it's best not to spend too much gold, because you don't make back 
a whole lot of gold. If you really want to just make as much gold as possible, it's probably best to just not spend anything on modifiers. But if you're going for better items, then yes, you want to make things more challenging. You want to increase your drop rates. You want to have a chance at finding those unique items, those legendaries. And then once you're in the expedition, again, you can keep delving deeper and deeper and deeper. A total of five levels, I believe, you can go through before you reach the end. Once you've done that the first time, you unlock Veteran Mode, where you can start at a higher than baseline level. The baseline, I believe, is level 40, so you can now start the dungeon at level 43 instead. And the deeper you go, you'll unlock higher and higher difficulties. So that should cover our beginner guide here. If you have any questions, I encourage you to leave them in the YouTube comments below. I'll try to answer them or make future videos that expand more, maybe give more tips. Again, this is a new game. We're all going to be diving into it. We're going to explore what's best. If you have some best practices, I encourage you to share them down below as well. And I encourage you to check out the Steam link in the video description below to check out Wilson's page in case you haven't. Also, stay tuned for my final video in the series in which I'll go over a build guide of this build here that got me to level 50 with no trouble. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.